On this episode of Locked on Angels, the Halos win two out of three against the Mariners this weekend, and John's going to laugh and laugh and laugh, but we are going to talk about the debut of two young, really good pitchers. We're going to talk about what they did well and what they need to work on. It's time to get Locked on with Mike and John, and this is Locked on Angels. You are Locked on Angels, your daily Los Angeles Angels podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SiriusXM by searching Locked On Angels. And if you'd like to get back to the Super Halo Bros for all this Super Halo content, here's some things that you can do. Leave us a rate and a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. And if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe and become a Locked On Everydayer. And whether you're watching or listening, come over to YouTube, leave a comment. It's one of the best ways to get in touch with John and I and be a part of the conversation. And this episode of Locked On Angels is brought to you by FanDuel, now through September. September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Happy Monday to you, and thanks for being here for this episode of Locked on Angels, where it's your team every day. You've got the First Brothers here with you, a.k.a. the Super Halo Bros. My name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. It's uh, our third season here at Locked on Angels. We're coming to a close here pretty soon. It's September 2nd already. What the yep. heck? Where'd the time go? Wow. And we're here five days a week talking Angels baseball with you. On today's show, we're going to recap the weekend and especially focus on the two starts from Samuel Aldegheri and Caden Dana Michael. Uh, an exciting weekend all around. Feels oh so uh, delicious <laughs> to win the season series against the Mariners. Yeah. To take two out of three. From the Mara Winers and Seattle Lowell loses the weekend series. Oh, yep. it's just, I, I, you better stop me because I'm just going to keep going on and on and on about it. Why don't you go ahead and take uh, game one? Well, the Angels were uh, eight and five against the Mariners this year, Johnny. So that was really great. Appreciated their uh, coming through against this team that we dislike so much. The Friday night game, John, was not a fun game to watch late. However, it was fun, and there was a lot of anticipation for Samuel Altagiri. He did have a rough first inning, and the mm-hmm. reason why he had a rough first inning, John, two reasons, actually. Errors, and he struggled to locate anything other than his fastball. So let's yeah. first talk about those errors. Altagiri had two on with two out and was facing Jorge Polanco. So he was going to get out of the inning, John, and had, without any damage. But then right. Polanco hits a liner off of the glove of Zach Neto. Neto should have made the catch. He'll tell you that he should have made the catch. And that ball went into the outfield and then they were able to score some runs. And then the second piece that he struggled with in that first inning was his control. He then hit the next two batters and then Mitch Garver doubled in both of those guys and drove in two. And then Victor Robles then singled and the Mariners got their fifth run of the inning. So John, do you think that was first inning jitters or do you think that this first inning doesn't quote unquote count for Samuel Aldegiri? It's frustrating because he should have been out of the inning and the the line looks a whole lot different. I know they were unearned runs and mm-hmm. really the the true runs that he surrendered was the the home run to Julio Rodriguez and you know there's no shame in that considering, you know, the matchup there. But here's the thing. It seems like every young pitcher in that first inning always comes out with some jitters, whether it's the Angels, whether it was you know, Paul Skeens or something. I mean, I listened to Paul Skeens on the radio, his debut, and and you know he had he had a decent first game. And so I think, Mike, considering the fact that one, he expected to be out of an inning and he wasn't, and two, it was just so obvious that he struggled to locate anything other than the fastball, as you mentioned. And when your fastball is 92, 93, 94, you're not fooling anybody. Sure. And you have to use your secondary stuff. And when your secondary stuff isn't working, well, then you're going to get shellacked like he did here. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, it was, yeah, a couple, couple hard hit balls. And, and that one that was hit toward Neto was a hard hit ball, but Neto didn't, he didn't look the ball into his glove. And so, yeah. To me, first inning jitters, I would say the same thing about Caden Dana on Sunday, and we're going to talk about that as well. But the good news is the jitters went away in the second 
and the third inning, and we got a better understanding of who Aldeguerre can be. He got the next seven batters after that. He had trouble in the fourth inning, gave up that two-run two home run that I mentioned to Julio Rodriguez. So at that point, it was 7-2, to two, but he had only given up the two Ernie's, Five were unearned. It's funny how that works, right? He should have been out of an inning, but yep. then five runs proceed to score. And, and that's honestly the thing is it's a combination of a, of a young guy who is making his debut and doesn't know how to stop the bleeding, so to speak, or sure. plug the leak. And that's sure. really what happened to him in that first inning. So through five innings, he surrendered six hits. The final line, five innings pitched. Seven runs, two earned, six hits, two walks, two hit by pitches. Again, control issues and three strikeouts. Uh, your thoughts on how Aldegheri debuted on Friday? Well, I think that we first have to address the Zach Neto issue, and we will in the second segment because there was something that happened right. in the second game that was interesting. So we'll talk about that in the second segment. But what I saw from him was what you tweeted about. He was overthrowing a bit in the first inning. He was also not really being able to look at any, anything but that fastball. And anything that he was throwing, John, he was either missing low or missing high or missing outside. You could tell that it was going to go there. Like, remember back when you're playing the show, like it has the ball where it's going to hit, right? And you can kind of tell if it's going to be a ball or a strike. Mm -hmm. I felt like I felt like the ball was out of the zone constantly if he was playing the show. Because you could tell that anything off speed was not going to be in the strike zone. So why am I even going to attempt to swing at it? Right. And, and anything close. I remember anything close at all to the zone that could have gone, you know, strike or ball was being called a ball. Yeah. And that has to do with the fact that he wasn't locating right very well. But even when he had a fastball on the edge, he wasn't getting those calls. And I remember yeah. getting frustrated because, you know, the opposing pitcher is getting all kinds of calls. Uh, it was George Kirby. Yeah. And, 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 but that's George Kirby. And he's got a reputation and he's right. got control and he's got the ability to, to make those pitches. So, yeah. Yeah. All of that to say, I'm not upset about the debut. I think it no. was kind of a, it was a, we had been talking about Aldegheri and how like he's a stuff guy. Yeah. Not necessarily going to overpower you with this fastball, but then when you don't have that stuff at your disposal, right. That's going to be a problem for Aldegheri. I do. I do want to say that what we saw in innings two through five is probably more of what we'll see from Aldegheri right. moving forward. I think that that's the type of pitcher that he is. He settled down. He was able to throw his strikes with his fastball and with his off speed stuff. I love what uh, Jared Timms tweeted out. He said mm -hmm. uh, before the game, uh, don't judge Aldegheri off of the first inning. And, and yeah. I, and I love that because he's watching these young guys all of the time and he knows kind of what their rhythm is. And it seems to be with angel young pitchers, they struggle in that first or second inning. And so mm -hmm. seeing him come out and really do better in the second through five, the fifth inning, I thought was probably what we're going to see from him moving forward because he was using all of his pitches, John. And what I liked is that it was quick innings. He was yeah. throwing stuff in the zone, or it was at least it looked hittable. Got a lot of ground balls, got a few fly balls. I think that that's the Al Deguri that we're going to see moving forward, and I'm excited to see him in this rotation. The Halos tried to battle back in this one. They did get a home run in the bottom of the first from Taylor Ward. That was great to see. Neto singled and stole two bases, and then Sean Owell hit a sacrifice fly to score Neto. That was Neto trying to apologize for his first inning yeah. error. Uh, they got two more on a solo home run from Mickey Moniak, who had a huge weekend yeah. this past weekend. Drury got his third home run of the season. Finally, some Drury Drury duty. I uh, haven't been able to say that in a while, obviously, because I can't say <laughs> it now. That was a, a fifth run by Drury in the uh, uh, in the six with an RBI single. That's as close as they would get as the bullpen surrendered. Two more runs in this one. The Halos lost nine to five. So, yeah, a bit of a bummer that you know they didn't win the game or even win Aldegheri's debut. But I think at the end of the day, you can see you can see what was there, and yeah. you can see why they like him. Again, it, he's not uh, he's not an overpowering guy, more of a tricky guy. Yep. And he's going to induce the ground balls, the weak flyouts. Like there's going to be some contact, and yeah. he's going to give up a home run every now and then. He's going to miss that fastball, as we saw in this game. And the only thing is, is he can't be predictable. And without the secondary stuff. 
he just became way too predictable. As you mentioned, if it was off speed, probably out of the zone, above the zone, <laughs> you know, below the zone. And and hopefully we will see Al Deguri be able to settle down a little bit more in the next time out. Hey, thanks for making Lockdown Angels your first listen of the day. The Angels are playing the Dodgers on Tuesday at 638 Pacific time. You can catch every pitch of the Angels hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. All you got to do is search Angels coming up on Lockdown Angels. Caden Dana, Angels number one prospect, got his first major league win on Sunday. We're going to tell you what he did and how he earned that win. We'll talk about it coming right up. Locked on Angels is brought to you by FanDuel. They're America's number one sports book. And right now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and then get three weeks free, a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. You should do that this week because the NFL season starts Thursday. So if you do it this week, you'll get the first three weeks for free if you bet Five dollars on FanDuel, and this is their gift to you. Then, with YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every single Sunday afternoon out of market game, which is great for like fans like us of the 49ers. We don't get to watch them all the time, and so I'm gonna bet five dollars this week, John, because I'm gonna at least try for three free weeks. All you need to do is a get a Google account and a current form of payment, and that you can cancel anytime. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. This is the Lockdown Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And every dayers, we're so excited to invite you to the Ohapi All Star Bowl. It's an event being put on by Logan Ohapi. He's inviting his teammates. And the goal is to raise funds for Corey's Promise. They're a nonprofit organization that helps offset the financial burden of families as their children battle pediatric cancer. And so it's a great cause in honor of Logan's former teammate from the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, We're going to be there at Cow Bowl on Saturday, October 5th in Lakewood from 1 to 4 p.m. We're bowling together. We're supporting a great cause. And the Angels are going to be there to bowl with us. We're going to see Logan Ohapi. Some of his teammates are going to be there. So grab your tickets by clicking the link in the episode description. And when you do, use our promo code BROS as in Super Halo Bros, at checkout. That's B-R-O-S at checkout so that you can take $50 off your ticket for the Ohapi All-Star Bowl. We can't wait to see you there. We can't wait to bowl with you and hang out with you and meet some of these Angel players. We're super excited about that, so we hope you'll join us on October 5th. Johnny, the game on Saturday was a terrible game at first, <laughs> and then it became a really fun game later on. So right. let me talk about it. We've been talking about pitching. There wasn't a young guy pitching for the Angels. It was Tyler Anderson pitching for the Angels in this game. And struggle, Johnny. Hmm. Four innings, six hits, four earned, three walks, three Ks, two home runs. Just to give you an idea of how it went for Tyler Anderson and Angel pitching. Through the first five innings, the Mariners pitchers, which was just one, he threw 47 pitches. Mm-hmm. Angel pitchers, which was Anderson and then Brock Burke, 113 pitches. <laughs> and so they threw a lot. Felt like Tyler Anderson from last year. So, John, do you think um, – obviously, we've talked about how he was going to regress and how the expected numbers were going to match up. Do you think that keeping Anderson was more about the Angels wanting to have him in this rotation? Or was it that the, the league – saw the regression coming and they were like, we're not, we're not trading for him or giving you what you want for him. Mike, here's, here's the thing. If, if you and I can see it and (laughs) two nerds with a podcast, they have much more data and insight and analytics. They have all that stuff. They are way more than you and I do. Right. And if you and I saw it, then other teams certainly saw it. And every dayers, have made that argument with us. And at first I was like, yeah, but still like you, you're going to take a risk on Alex Cobb who hasn't thrown a pitch this season versus Tyler Anderson, who has a track record. I think I need to eat a little bit of crow here because Mm. our everydayers who called it out, I think you're right. I think honestly, a big part of Tyler Anderson not moving is because teams knew that the underlying numbers 
would catch up with him. And to be fair, there were some everydayers that said, I don't care about underlying numbers. I like what Tyler Anderson's putting up. I like the results. And I also understand that side. But you and I have said all season, Mike, the underlying numbers, whether you're underperforming and your numbers should be better or you're overperforming and your numbers, they say that you should be worse. They always catch up to you. They do. Doesn't doesn't matter if you're being a stud or you're having a down year. The expected numbers will always catch up with you. I think that's what we're seeing with Tyler Anderson. Yep. I think that we're, what else we're seeing is that it's been a long dang season and he's covered a lot of innings. He's thrown a lot of pitches. He certainly performed better than last year. That's for sure. Yeah. So perhaps at this point of the year, it's it's the dog days of summer. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just they're at that point where everybody's struggling and it's not just Tyler Anderson either. Right. We saw Zach Neto in this one yeah. uh, get yanked from the game as well. So yeah, I think all of that to say, yes, it's catching up with him. Yes. I think teams had the same concerns that we did. And also it's, it's September 2nd guys. Like it's a, it's sure. a long season. <laughs> yeah. This game really offensively was uh, Joe Adele and Mickey Moniak. They, they were excellent in this game. Joe Adele hit two home runs. He's now got 20 on the season, just five ah, stolen. DFA, bust, <laughs> 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 home runs. Who cares? But I, I, John, I do, I do want to talk about that eighth inning. I know we, <laughs> there's a great ending to this game, but before we get to Mickey Moniak, and the ending of this game. Oh, brother. In the eighth inning, the Angels tried that uh, famous Ron Washington squeeze play. So Ward's at third, nobody out. Jack Lopez is bunting. He, he bunts, the ball hits the plate, and or in front of the plate, just kind of stops. So the catcher tags Ward and then throws the first to double off Lopez. Now, here's what Wash said about that bunting play. And I'm just going to, once I'm done reading it, I'm going to be quiet because I know that you have thoughts. So he said, talking about Jack Lopez. He's supposed to get that bunt down out in front of the pitcher. If you notice the technique that he used, he tried to deaden the ball. I don't know what that was about. I did that because I felt that we had the right guy in the right spot to get a quick run. And I did it. And he just didn't execute. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to be quiet. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Mike, I totally understand why Wash would make that call in the moment because uh, you know, when I think of Jack Lopez, I think of David Eckstein and Adam Kennedy. I think of, you know, just these terrific base to uh, bat to ball guys who could bunt and move runners over. I think of Sean Fick. What are you talking about? The right guy in the right moment. <laughs> Jack Lopez is 31 years old. who made his debut in the majors right. two weeks ago. Right. And it's like, how do you know? Who you have in that moment with Jack Lopez yeah. and slow Taylor Ward at third base. Now, God bless Taylor Ward because he did everything he could in that moment to, right. to get safe. But there was just no chance. But, Mike, the bigger issue here is, yes, I agree. If a manager asks you to do something, you need to do it. Yeah. But, but where this bothers me and where it bothered me with the Luis Guillorme thing that we talked about back in what May was that May mm -hmm. is totally wrong call, totally wrong situation. Yeah. Totally bizarre. Read the room of uh, read reading of the room. I guess I should say, because nobody out, there's no chance of a double play. You have Sean Owell on deck who, by the way, hit a inning ending fly out. Yep which would have scored Taylor Ward from third base. So I just, yes, do what your manager is telling you to do. But manager, what the heck are you doing? Ron yeah. Washington, what the yeah. heck are you? You've tried this squeeze thing like 10 times this yeah. season, and yeah. it's worked one time. And every other time you've tried it, you've been embarrassed. You've had to answer for it. You've had to talk about it after a game. I don't understand it. There was a there was somebody on, uh, his name was Mike on Twitter, who said, well, you know, it's the time of year where you can try that kind of stuff. I said, Mike, I totally understand. I agree. But the problem here is that Jack Lopez is not going to be on this team next year. Yeah. And Taylor Ward, you know, we'll see what happens with him over the offseason. But maybe you could have convinced me that this was okay if it was like Neto Bunting or yeah. Sean Owell or Adele or Moniac or somebody, Mike. But, but to say, like, this is a valuable moment for these young guys. 
Not Jack Lopez. He's yeah. 31. Not Taylor Ward. He's 32. You know what I mean? Like, I just yeah. don't, I don't understand this call at all. But no. fortunately, fortunately, we saw, like you said, the two home runs from Joe Adele. He's got the 20 home run season, five stolen bases from a 2020 season. Moniac homers, both of them off Brian Wu. Fantastic. And then Big Ben Joyce comes in in a tie game, right, Mike? Yeah, tie game, comes in, keeps it tied, and does what we need him to do. And then in the bottom of the ninth, two outs, Mickey Moniak hits a game-winning home run. And it was a no-doubter, which was great. Johnny, I I love this tweet. Again, friend of the pod, Jared Timms, tweeted this. Mickey Moniak over his last 19 games, 359 batting average, 397 on on base, and a 719 OPS, 210 weighted runs created plus, five doubles, six homers, 11 runs and 13 RBIs. The guy just needs playing time, man. And that's really what the Angels have been able to give him in the last few months. And he has proven that when he can get hot, he can really be a terror in that lineup. And I think Mm -hmm. playing over a consistent amount of time allows him to get enough at bats to where he's seeing the ball really well and making good contact. Now, you did mention, and I mentioned it in the first segment, about Zach Neto. Zach mm-hmm. Neto was removed from this game. And according to Wash, it was because he wasn't playing well. He said he, uh, that Neto wasn't in it tonight. And sometimes yeah. you have to teach them a lesson. Neto said his frustrations got the best of him. In fact, he said me and Wash have a really good relationship. And he thought it was best to take me out in that moment. And I respect it. And I'm just trying to be a good teammate. Give me your thoughts. Yeah, he had the air uh, and he was caught sleeping. Didn't make the play at second that he should have. and. You know, I think that there's a a fine line you have to walk with some of these guys where you recognize uh, that's a mistake. Wash knows Neto really well. And I think that there's a there's a recognition there, Mike, of something's off with this guy. Yeah, something's not right. Yeah, his head between the ears, like something is not going right for him. He's frustrated. He just doesn't seem to be paying attention, doesn't care. And you know what? For, for as ridiculous as the squeeze play was, I actually think I agree with Wash on this one. Well, and I would say to you, like, I think that that's Wash's gifting. And I think he's got to stay within himself, stay yeah. within his gifting as, as a manager. He is able to read the players really, really well. I think in those situations on the on the field, like that squeeze play, I think he needs to pause and, and ask a second question. <laughs> Should I do this, right? Mm-hmm. But when taking out like Zach Neto, he's able to really feel the pulse of his players. And that's what he really brings to this team. What he doesn't bring is a great strategic mind when it comes to situational moments on the field all of the time. There have been moments where he's been great. But I like that he and and that Zach Neto talked about this and shared what was going on because I think this is where Ron Washington is at his best. Yeah, and and you go back to Friday night, Neto struggled as well. I know that Neto, you know, when we when we left our everydayers on Friday, we just got through talking about, hey, 2020 season, 2020 season with Neto. Right. So he should be riding high, but you could clearly see that, you know, he's been struggling offensively. It's, it's been a tough go for him. It's been a tough go for Logan Ohapi. I mean, you know, they sat Ohapi on Sunday, maybe because it was a day game and maybe because they wanted Thice behind the plate, but ohapi has been awful yeah. in the month of August. So yeah. to me, I, I don't really have a problem with him pulling Neto in this one, especially when you could clearly see something going on. And Mike, this is their first full season. For, yeah, for Neto, for Sean Owell, for Ohapi, for Adele. It's their first full season. And I think these are the moments that you have to, <laughs> you mentioned Andy Griffith before we got, came on to record. <laughs> you got to nip it in the bud. Yeah. Because otherwise, maybe Neto becomes Rendon. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I don't know if that's, a, if you can make sure. a straight line from that, but for I'm sure, just sure. saying like, that's the kind of thing that you can't let these guys spiral. Yeah. And you can't let them continue to play a game if their head's not in it yeah. or if, if they just clearly don't care. Yeah. And I think that that's an important thing for Wash to do. Locked on Angels is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. They're now the authorized ticket marketplace in Major League Baseball, and they can get your tickets a whole lot easier and a whole lot faster. They're obsessed with saving you time and money. When you're buying your tickets, you can get last minute deals on game time and save up to 60% off, not just on sports, but concerts, comedy, theater, 
and so much more. Game Time has all-in pricing. It's a great feature that shows you the upfront total. There's no surprise fees at checkout. They also give you a panoramic view of where your seat will be before you buy that seat. And they have the lowest price guarantee. Game Time is going to credit you 110% of the difference if you find tickets in the same section and a lot cheaper. They're going to hook you up, and I love that. And then they also have uh, game time ticket coverage. With every purchase, your ticket is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry, which is great because you never know if you get a cold or a situation or work calls, whatever comes up, right? Game time is going to work with you. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. You can download the app, use our promo code locked on MLB, get $20 off your first purchase. Again, use our promo code locked on MLB, $20 off your first purchase. Johnny, what time is it? Game time. Mike, the highly anticipated debut of Caden Dana took place on Sunday. The yep. Angels won that game 3-2. to two. Before we get into, really, the, the bread and butter of this game and the discussion, it's, it's important to talk about how we got there. Ward leads off the game with a solo home run. Um, <laughs> wait, you read this note because yeah. this is really funny to me. <laughs> so, Ward hits a this. home run, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm watching the game and I wrote, this, I wrote this down. Can Julio stop pretending to catch the ball or not catch the ball? That's an old bit. Like that's such an old bit and and you're not good and you're not having a great season and yeah. the Mariners aren't going anywhere. So stop with the, did he get it? Did I catch it? Did I, it's so annoying. It's so, he's just an <laughs> annoying player. He is so annoying. And I'm so glad we're not having to play him again this year. Okay, let's go. <laughs> but Mike, everyone said he's going to be the next Mike Trout. Yep. Just like, uh, you know, how many other next Mike Trouts have we talked about? Right. Over right. the years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, he's my annoying. goodness. Don't like him. Luke Rayleigh, though, did get the M's on the board in this game. Johnny solo home run in the second. And then he added a, uh, they added a sack fly in the third. The Angels did battle back uh, to take the lead in the fifth with runners at second and third with two outs. Am I reading this right? Anthony Rendon. <laughs> Anthony yeah, Rendon buddy. hit a line drive to the shortstop, goes off the heel of the glove and into left field, and both Ward and Neto scored. And and really, John, that's all that Cade and Dana needed because he looked good in this one. Six innings, two earned, four Ks, four walks. I, I want you to walk us through what you saw from Cade and Dana in this game. Yeah, can I be honest with you? Please. I I am torn on him having number 36 because that's Weaver's number. Yeah. You see and we tweeted, Hey, that's big shoes to fill. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? He's right. Big yeah. shoes to fill. Yeah. But, but I shouldn't be surprised, Mike, because they've handed out 14. They've handed out 15. They've handed out 16. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, they get, you know, trout and Vladdy senior wear 27. And so just, there's no, there's no right rhyme or reason to any of these right. numbers. However, if anyone's going to wear it with pride and have the potential to be Weaver esque in his successes, I think it's Caden Dana. So I'm yep. looking forward to that. But Mike, I just wanted to kind of take it, you know, out by out, pitch by pitch, and talk about like what we saw from Caden Dana. Caden Dana, and it was kind of the same as Aldegary at first. It was struggling to locate anything that wasn't the fastball, except you know he was a little bit wild to Julio in that first inning he got a big curveball to Cal Raleigh a swing and the miss on the fastball for the K to end the inning his he got a first pitch out to Randy a Rose arena it gets to Owen two to Polanco now this is interesting to me he threw an 87 mile an hour cutter mm -hmm. which do you remember the conversations we've had with Reed Detmers and how last year he was throwing everything a little bit harder and yeah. so it was like is that a slider is that a cutter well it seemed like Dana was kind of throwing a variation of this, two variations of the same pitch. It was supposed to be his slider. He would throw it a little harder and it would have more cutter movement or register as a cutter on stat cast. Either way, he was able to use it effectively. So not only was he getting quick outs with his fastball, but he had that slider cutter thing going on. And then what I love seeing was getting some sweet strikeouts on yeah. a changeup, which scouts were all saying that that was their biggest thing about Caden Dana is can he develop that changeup? Well, I just say from what I saw, it looked pretty good. And to be honest with you, he, you know, he gave that home run to Rayleigh that you mentioned still didn't quite have a feel for his off speed stuff at that point of the game. That was the top of the second. 
Then he gets around an automatic double in the top of the third that led off the inning with a ground out to first, a sacrifice fly, and then he jammed Julio Rodriguez with a ground out to short. And again, it was that it was that cutter slider thing that he was throwing up yeah. there. Um, he did walk Cal Raleigh. He got a pop up from a Rosarena and then induced a double play. Neto tagged the runner on the what was that a towel or a glove sticking out the back of his pocket Dude, there? His pocket like, was hanging out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then top of the fifth gets a strikeout to Rayleigh. Started to show some better control on the off speed. I noticed as it was going on, a nasty slider got Mitch Hanniger to pop out to right field. Gave up two walks. Then it seemed like the fastball was kind of going away. Wasn't getting anything close. And then he struck out Victor Robles with that cutter slider thing that he was throwing. Finally, he gets Julio jammed on that cutter, a long fly out. Uh, there was a, another walk to Cal Raleigh, a backup cutter to a Rosarena, and then a fly out from Polanco. So really, Mike, kind of reminded me of Al Daguerre in mm -hmm. a sense that, mm -hmm. yes, he did have more success. And yes, obviously, Caden is the more ready now pitcher. But what I saw was a guy coming out of the bullpen, struggling to have a feel for all of his pitches right away. And then after a few innings went by, he really settled down. Uh, the fastball, he was really relying on that early. That started to go away a little bit. But as that location started to go away, I thought he was getting tired. But then as that started to go away, it felt like the off-speed stuff was really coming around. He was locating it well. He was inducing weak contact and happy to see the, the four strikeouts. <laughs> talk talk about the the four walks uh thought that you had because yeah as we share the line of what Kate and Dana had there's a lot of comments of well but four walks I mean yeah three, three. <laughs> saw that with 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 our show also saw that with Angels win and they had a great tweet about how they're going to pray for people who don't think that Kate and Dana had a great start which I thought was funny <laughs> the, the reality is is that those four walks didn't hurt him and no. he's 20 and it's his first start he, and so he pitched around them that was the absolutely thing is he pitched around any trouble that he got into and very rarely do you see that from a young pitcher very rarely do you see that from Patrick Sandoval or Reed Detmers Mike right. or Griffin Ganning right. they're pitching around guys they're not letting it get to them he had composure he had poise mike poise yeah. counts right? yeah <laughs> and his and his late inning control came from his off-speed stuff that's right. where he was working he pivoted john and one other note what i loved about this game is after an inning where he struggled but then got out of it did you notice that matt thice walked up to him and mm -hmm. they walked to the dugout together mm -hmm. so good on matt thice for like encouraging him, leading him. I thought that that was a really good moment. And it seemed to be like they had some good synergy between Kate and Dana and Matt Theis yesterday. Somebody did ask us who we'd like to see catching him and wondered if it would be Theis or Ohapi. And I said, well, I'd like to see Ohapi catch the, the starters, the new starters. But to be honest with you, I got to thinking about it over the weekend. I thought, I think Theis is actually the right guy for that moment mm. because he, he does do more of that, Mike. Let's yeah. be honest. He does do more of that. Sometimes you and I criticize and say, Thice, you're doing too much back there. Sure. Calm, calm down, buddy. You don't need yeah. to point. You don't need to do the glove point every time. So they makes a pitch, right? Yeah. Um, you don't need to walk out to the mound so much, but I think he was the right guy in that moment for Caden Dana. Angels PR tweeted that Caden Dana becomes the youngest pitcher to win a game for the angels since Frank Tanana Woo. in 1973 and the youngest to win his MLB debut in franchise history. Mike, youngest pitcher making his debut on the Angels since K-Rod in 2002. So wow. just a fun weekend all around. Uh, Caden Dana picks up the W. A great debut for him. And a loss for the Mariners. <laughs> Hey, thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On MLB with our friend Soli. He is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, and he's a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I'm just going to write eight and five on Twitter and just see <laughs> if people know what that means. Actually, yeah. that'd be kind of fun. I think I'm going to do that. Speaking of Twitter, follow us at Locked On Angels on Twitter and at Super Halo Bros on Twitter and Instagram. Again, if you want to sign up, for the Ohapi All-Star Bowl. We'd be happy to see you there. The link is in the episode description. Use our promo code BROS to take $50 off your ticket. Mike, what do we have on deck for tomorrow's show? Reed Detmers is back, and what he said about his time in the minor leagues was, 
interesting. And so we're going to share what he said and also talk about that starting rotation for the rest of of September tomorrow on Locked On Angels. Looking forward to that conversation. Until then, my name is John, and that's my brother, Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother, John. Thanks for being here with us, everybody, and we'll see you back here on Tuesday. <laughs> well done.